Welcome to episode 5 of the Nurtured by Nature podcast. Today I'm delighted to be joined in conversation by the incredible Philippa Ross. Philippa is a self-confessed enthusiologist, something the world certainly needs a lot more of. Based in New Zealand, she is also a human ecologist, energy worker, writer and the force behind the Waste Not, Want Not podcast. During this inspiring episode, we dived into her fascinating ancestral connection to the Antarctic and her love of the world's oceans, explored ways we can all turn inwards to nurture our inner environments, and discussed how approaching others with humility and humbleness allows us to listen with an open heart and open mind, whilst also considering the challenges created in managing environmental issues particularly in the world's oceans, where our boundaries and borders allow governments to shy away from their responsibilities. But ultimately, we found comfort in the wisdom offered by her family motto, Hope Lightens Difficulty. Uh, welcome, Philippa, and thanks for joining us on, on this episode of the Nurtured by Nature podcast. Um, I like to start all my episodes by just asking my guests a little bit about their nature story and how nature has been a part of your life and if that's evolved over time, um, if it's been there since childhood or something you've discovered more recently. Hello, um, lovely. Thank you very much for having me, Fiona. It's been it's an absolute pleasure. Um, well, I guess in my childhood, I was very much a townie until about the age of 11. And my father decided he'd like to be a farmer, having been in <laughs> computers um, for all his life. And so the great outdoors called me and I really loved it. I had this, um, borrowed this horse and um, for the winter and it did nothing more than just bucking and swerving and, and basically throwing me off. And then, <laughs> so that was a learning curve. And then um, I had this old mining pony um, oh. that we bought. And she was beautiful, beautiful nature once you could catch her. I think I spent three quarters of my life running around the field, up and down hills, trying to catch her. But my um, girlfriend and I, we used to spend hours out um just riding around and I could only ride her bareback because you couldn't get a saddle to fit her and so my it was an unconscious thing that I really really loved it and then as the years went on you just get busy and things like that and then I took a degree in psychology wow. and after I, it took me six years it was really when I came to New Zealand 19 years ago it was part of the reason was to escape England where it's cold and dark and miserable most of the year where this is nice and light and bright and which is yummy and it is that environment and it started to play a huge part in the quantum physics and the appreciation of how much you are impacted because of the cold and dark for me I love light and bright and sun mm -hmm. and it does make a huge difference to how you feel and things like that and also played in with the work that I do in mentoring because it's about our internal environment affects our external environment and vice versa and so I love nothing more than the ocean there's a beach nearby wherever you happen to be so that oh, is my wow. sanctuary um yeah it's um fortunately it's not all year round i think it might be more so in australia but in new zealand we have a a kind of winter but it's not nearly so severe or as long as it is in the uk so i'm glad that i escaped for that reason and then i have um my connection to the ocean got deeper six years ago i went to antarctica because of my great oh, great great grandfather and he discovered he was a polar explorer, so he did all the cold things, which, yuck. Um, but he discovered the North Magnetic Pole in the Arctic and did oh, six amazing. journeys there, and three to Antarctica, and I went to Antarctica. And when you come back, it was 
It took me two months to recalibrate in this environment, even in New Zealand, because the subliminal noise and the visual distractions and things. Yeah. So it was a very humbling experience. And it taught me that mankind thinks they have one up on nature, but they haven't. And we need nature, but nature doesn't need us. It's quite happy doing its own thing without us. And yeah, it's. Yeah. It is a great healing. Yeah, I think it's... Um, so that, that was my very short process. <laughs> yeah, no, that's brilliant. It's, um, I, think that's, I think that is the thing, isn't it? I think um, when you go to some of these more extreme, I think it's probably the best description, environments like Antarctica, maybe like the deserts and things like that, then yeah. it does become... You, you sort of realise your own insignificance, I suppose, don't you? And it, it is yeah. that humbling... Yeah experience of you know mother nature on this massive grand scale that perhaps when you're in um a more sort of slightly urbanized environment that you it we haven't allowed it in on that level have we in in our sort of urban culture so was there a particular moment in Antarctica that stood out for you or is it just the whole whole experience um, I think there was one night because it's um, daylight 24-7 when I went in in the summertime and it was like the moon set so everything was pink and oh. there was this little baby chick and I was just lying in the snow doing making angels in the snow and this little baby chick came alongside me and he was doing the same thing with his <laughs> wings he was just delicious oh amazing <laughs> oh that sounds incredible oh yeah I couldn't I, I've never been to Antarctica it's somewhere I'd love to go but I can just I have this rich picture in my mind of of that moment it sounds amazing um, but you you touched a little bit on your ancestry. I know um, that's been quite important to you. And um, you were also involved in, I think, um, something to do with the Ross Sea, weren't you, um, In around that sort of time? Yes, there was um, this marine protection. So my um, ancestor, Sir James Clark Ross, he discovered the Ross Sea region of Antarctica. And it was one of the many... Um, areas on the table to be to get marine protection and in 2016 it was actually the very same year that I went to Antarctica at the latter part of the year that it was granted um, by CAMLA which is basically made up of 24 countries and the EU so they meet on an annual basis in Hobart um, to decide on these things and um, ever since then, I mean, there's been three more on the table. It's Russia and China who are not happy about letting go and can't see this big picture thing about nature. And, you know, I always think, to me, nature has no boundaries like the sea and the land. We as mankind have created it and we have created problems for ourselves with that and thinking that we can have one over. So, yeah, so the marine protection came through, made official in 2017. And I think I play, I was part of it for a microscopic part. There was an amazing organizations and individuals involved for about five years before it actually came through. So, and I was one of the, um, because I have my own podcast, Waste Not, Want Not, and one of my guests was Dr. Rodolfo Werner, who is a krill specialist. And he does a lot of the oh, wow, okay. talking between all these um, delegates and things like that. And he's been doing it for 19 years. And oh, how he hasn't torn his hair out, because yeah. there's only been one marine protected area in all that time. So tenacity and a love for doing what you're doing. And he just loves nature. And he'll fight to the end for it. Oh, it's it's a it's amazing to hear that um, you've you've achieved. I know probably on some levels it feels like a small success, but um, like you say, because it's only the one. But actually, at the same time, it's a huge success because you've actually got that that first one under the belt. And um, it, yeah. it it is yeah. difficult. And I think um, I mean I'm I'm not hugely involved in the oceans. I think you've probably got a much better understanding of it than I have, but. 
one of the challenges, like you said, is the boundary issue, isn't it? Of, you know, the land is quite clearly, well, this belongs to such and such and that yep. belongs to such and such. And so they have the sort of final say over what they will and won't do, whereas the ocean is is this great sort of um, expanse of there's no clear exact line and and like you say it's just it's it's a moving entity as well so you know boundary means nothing it's you know if a fish doesn't get to that bit and go oh now I'm in you know Australian <laughs> water or you know I'm off on exactly. my holidays to New Zealand or... I think that's a really big part so far as nature is concerned and the cyclic part of it it does go around and people recognize okay Antarctica is far away and maybe have nothing to do with anybody else but those waters reach the northern region in the Arctic and they circulate the world. And so anything that goes out there does have an impact. It's irrespective of actually where you live in the world. And I think that's one of the really, really important things. And the cyclic na nature of marine life as well, because uh, Rudolfo was um, talking about um, krill which is the bottom of the food chain, and they created the first World Krill Day. And as you said, there's no boundaries between land and sea. So there's an Antarctic treaty for the land, but nothing to do with the sea. And then you have the high seas, which nobody has any rights over. So trying to bring that aspect of things in as well. Um, and I think really it's for mankind to recognize um, it's all very well. There's so many policies. We tie ourselves in complete knots yeah. and it's just like, let go and let nature be. Who the heck do we think we are to interfere? Yeah. And I think um, it's also, it's that sort of notion that you use the word responsibility. And I think um, in a lot of stuff I've, I've looked at and read about, about more sort of indigenous uh, knowledge and cultures, around the world is they have ingrained this this idea of responsibility whereas are more um do I say developed I don't really like that word but uh, western our, world <laughs> yeah our western, western world that's western. our western world view is more one of rights isn't it and it's like we have yes. you know we own yeah. this we have the right and we've lost that link to to our responsibility to it and and this more overarching bigger world view of you know we're everything is very much sort of like you said micromanaged with a very short termist a couple of years I know in the UK our governments are only here for maximum of five years so that's their view is their view is like what are, what is five years time because in five years time it might be a different party or it will maybe to be different people and and it does create this very like short termist view and they don't want to take that responsibility because quite often that ties into economics as well doesn't it of uh absolutely yeah, who, who's going to pay for it and they're like we don't want to put our hands up um and you do you end up in this these uh you know situations that obviously there's been a couple of the cops recently and it's been a lot more talking <laughs> and not not again not much action and oh I think, my gosh yeah I think um I'm beginning know. to lose faith in some of those you know um particularly the last cop it was just 800 private planes going to a meeting to tell us to be careful of carbon emissions and it's sponsored by coca-cola and I just think the hypocrisy of it is just futile. Yeah. And we are trying to get dominion over nature to serve our immediate economy with the boundaries around it. And we won't let go of like China with their fishing rights and Russia because they're just bloody minded that um, they're not thinking on a global scale and how it's yeah. going to conserve things and recognize so far as the ocean and the land is concerned they are actually the entities that support our very life. <laughs> yeah. Yes. And I think um I think that's part of, of probably why you started your podcast and I've started mine as well is is this feeling that actually you know we we I'm a bit tired of listening to all the talk from from these sort of governmental organizations and even the large corporations and I'm but I have noticed that there's a lot more grassroots movements and there's a lot of people yes 
that are doing just small things perhaps you know and but it's that kind of ripple effect and actually allowing people to a have a voice for those people that are doing it but b inspire others as well and and put a little bit of hope back in the story um because it it is what's presented through you know the mainstream media and and that governmental level is is very negative and yet they're not providing us any solutions and that that becomes overwhelming and and slightly have you you do lose hope don't you and I think that's um I mean well actually your family motto is involved with hope isn't it um it is it's hope lightens difficulty so Sir James Clark Ross was that was put on the family crest and yeah I hold that very dear to my heart because and as you say, that was the impetus behind my own podcast, which celebrates its first anniversary oh, um, at the beginning of December. And it's I wanted to put it out because, as you say, there's so much bad news and things. And it's really about the extraordinary things that everyday people are doing, whether it's the lady next door who's making some bars of soap to save plastic bottles because she likes making soap and selling them at the local market it doesn't have to be on a global scale and it's really giving people the impetus saying whatever you contribute does have value it doesn't have to be on a global scale you know um and the local groups um they all have a ripple effect so yeah it is such an important message that um I think people need need to hear and keep it going. Yeah, I think I think um, hope is probably like one of almost the most powerful forces in the world, and also that it's probably the greatest gift you can give someone, isn't it? Is that that idea that actually there is perhaps a light at the end of the tunnel, and um, it gives you a reason to to keep trying, doesn't it? And um, I don't know. I mean, is have you are there people that you've you found that have particularly inspired hope in your life that have given you the the courage to think no this is this is a battle that we can still we can still win I just I mean I'm amazed because I've now interviewed 50 people of all sorts of different things and I think um the big thing is not to change the mindset of people feeling hopeless where they are looking to others to create the change without taking that responsibility and knowing that just because the way the world has come that has made us become dependent on outside of ourselves to create solutions and to become someone and this kind of integrates with my mentoring is actually to recognize we have the power within and we can light that spark of hope within ourselves. And even just with one or two people, we can make a difference. And it doesn't, as I say, it doesn't matter. If I've spoken to someone who does something on a global scale with orangutans as opposed to the lady next door who makes goat's milk soap. And each one has their own value. And Different people do different things. Some people want to be centre stage or are quite happy being centre stage, like you and I starting a podcast and being vulnerable and putting your voice out where other people would just run in the opposite direction, you know? Um, yeah. yeah. I think I think that's the important thing, isn't it? I think sometimes people feel like they have to start that, you know, massive movement or organization or something that's going to be international and save the world but like you say actually it could be something as simple as you know you you make lovely organic soap that you sell in your local farm market farmers market or something like that and you just serve your local community and actually you know if, if you've made like a hundred bars of soap you've saved 100 plastic bottles from going into the environment and or possibly more even um and yeah yeah and it's it is I think sometimes that's overlooked isn't it in this you know by people who um you know and like you say I, I liked what you said as well about um realizing that actually you know we it's about the spark within us and um and how we can nurture that ourselves and I 
you talked about you do mentoring I mean do you want to sort of dive into a, a, a few ideas of like how you perhaps help people um well one of the things about? that I found well ultimately that's it because we're kind of indoctrinated with um a linear progression of um what is it to become someone and to be accepted rather than honoring the gifts that we have ourselves and every single one of the guests that I've had it's interesting when you get to their story were influenced in childhood and they the reason they keep going is they have found that spark the lady who does the goat's milk so soap she was allergic to cow's milk and then mm -hmm. um as a child and so she had that connection to goats and then she went off and did things with horses and came back and then got a small farm and she's hand reared goats and then she decided she had too much milk and things happen serendipitously to help us get back to what's important to us as an individual and that is the thing so we are not only serving to me it's about serving ourselves which has an effect on our community and then the world at large but we're taught not to serve ourselves because particularly English I can say this there's a lot of snobbery around it you know you're vain you're self-centered and or you're full of yourself and actually it's quite a compliment to be told you're full of yourself because it's actually standing in your power yeah. and knowing yourself and actually living that life as opposed to what other people expect of you to do and that is um it's a journey it doesn't happen overnight and sometimes we miss it and keeps coming around sort of thing but yeah it is that inner and outer and you find contentment when your internal and external environment um resonate with one another and so yet yeah, it's vitally important where so, so, i'm coming to new zealand when i visited 21 years ago i got off the plane and it felt like home i could not there's nothing tangible you could have said about it but it just felt like home mm. yeah i think um so i think that's quite an interesting thing isn't it of you basically saying about your inner environment and and that's something we can all work on isn't it regardless of you know where you are in the world or how you feel that you can influence your external environment but you can you can work with your internal environment and I mean obviously in in more recent years the ideas of of sort of well-being and and mindfulness have sort of come to the fore I know for both of us that's quite you know we're we're quite interested in in those realms of um you know sort of healing modalities and things and that is more accessible isn't it that's something that everyone can do um is is sort of is nurturing themselves it's getting to and um, tuning into your body and feeling the response and um trusting your gut because we're used to allowing the logical side of our brain to direct us in life as opposed to tuning into the heart and what is actually lights us up and makes us feel good because that's the thing that's going to create happiness contentment longevity um heal disease because a lot of disease is about discontentment disconnection displeasure dispirited lots of other i call it the d syndrome yeah, yeah. and i and i think um the the nature is twofold in there isn't there because obviously one of the best places to get in touch with yourself is while surrounding yourself with nature but at the same time as you get more in touch with yourself you become more connected to nature as well so it's it's like this beautiful journey isn't it of exploration yeah. I suppose <laughs> and the funny you know the more you go into it because my ancestor used the earth's magnetic field to navigate his way around and so but the um, earth's magnetic field is to do with the energy and like I say when I got off the plane in New Zealand I could not explain it but I resonated with the energy of the country and just being I mean it's probably not the ideal time of year to be doing it in England at the moment but to walk on the grass barefoot because the energy from the earth is very grounding and that's very very important because 
we're surrounded by computers and Wi-Fi and all sorts of things, which is, which is disrupting the brainwaves, really. Um, and so getting back to nature and hugging a tree like a good old fashioned hippie, there's nothing wrong with it, you know? <laughs> yeah, I think, I mean, I love, I love my trees and I do find, I think, um, when, when you're in sort of more forested environments, I find that's, um, when I feel like less of the, the sort of energetic pollution that we have, we have, we endure I really I suppose is probably the word for it we endure in our daily lives the quite a, a lot of energetic pollution now with like you say all the the wi-fi signals um you know the internet everything there's there's so much you know just because we can't see it it, it doesn't mean it's not there is it but I do yeah like no. trees in particular and a good hug with a tree <laughs> is um is a wonderful way to start or, or end a day um and uh, yeah, I think most of us somewhere have access to a tree, don't we? I think, which is also nice, even if you're... Well, the other thing is the, one of the things, the exercises I use, we're using the five senses because we've lost touch with our senses. We just kind of um, blinker our way through life. And if you're sitting in the forest or outside, shut your eyes because that actually shuts you off quite a bit. And you can really smell the richness of the earth. And the I love the smell of freshly mown grass or something like that, or, you know, the, the sun on, on grass or flowers, you walk past the center. And when you shut your eyes off, it's amazing how alive the rest of the senses come. So just tuning into those five senses on a daily basis, and taking one at a time just to focus on it and putting your hand on a tree you don't have to hug it if it feels weird for you but just to feel the bark and shut your eyes and the texture of it um it's very stimulating because we're not we just blase about stuff and you appreciate the patterns in nature and you see it in food and it's parts of the brain like walnuts the more you go into it, the more you discover, and it's mind blowing how, yeah, the yeah, our sacred geometry is another thing with the patterns of nature. It's 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 like a, a rabbit hole. Once you get to get going, it's never ending. It's lovely. Oh, yeah, <laughs> and but... as Einstein said, you know, nature's got look deep into nature, and you'll find all the answers. But we think we're so much more superior, and we're blooming well not. Yeah, I think I'm. Um that's something I, I I very much hold true in life is every day is a school day and I just you know I'm like reading some of the the sort of more recent um scientific developments around nature around trees around the fungi networks and things and it's yes. you know it's, it's just like there's so much in our world that we just don't know and I mean and that's exciting as well I think I mean I, I think yeah. it's um you know like there's but you have to have an open mind as well, because you have to say, well, you can't just say, oh, we've always done this or this, because it's like, well, actually, there's every day there's new things are being learned and understood. And I, I think as well, a little bit our technology is advancing enough that, you know, we yeah, we're yeah. finding ways to explain stuff that perhaps um, probably indigenous cultures <laughs> always knew. But our science was lacking the ability to to actually comp comprehend and um yeah but it is uh, there there's just so much isn't there there's it, it's but just find something that interests you I suppose is again coming back to that internal spark and passion and and um yeah yeah I remember seeing um I think it was on um it might have been the BBC Judy Dench because she loves trees and her garden and somebody came with the stethoscope or something and she could hear the tune. I mean, the tunes because sound and basically everything in life is a vibration. The different sounds of all her trees. And she was like a child with us in a sweetie shop, wasn't she? Absolutely yeah. fascinating. I love I, I saw that one as well. It's one of my favorites. Um and and it sounded like literally the moment he put the stethoscope on, it was like, oh my god, it sounds like a heartbeat. It's like listening to a human yeah. heartbeat. And um yeah, yeah it's, it is just absolutely 
I don't know, it's sort of mind blowing, I suppose, for, for want of a, a another word. But it's it is amazing how much it is out there, and 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 that's just on land. And like you say, the ocean is just an even bigger mystery to us, really, isn't it? Of, mm. Um, mm. I look at people like David Attenborough and Jane Goodall, who, you know, are obviously in their late 80s, and um, the patience and just, they're such delicious human beings because they don't ram it down their throat. They are so enamoured by what they're doing and connected to it. I think David Attenborough is getting slightly more exasperated nowadays, mm -hmm. probably because he's nearer the end of his life that not too many changes have, have taken place. But... It's just like wake up world. And Jane Goodall, I remember she came to New Zealand and I remember her saying, going to all these indigenous cultures and things, going in and saying, well, you need to do this, that and the other. We have to recognize as an outsider coming in what their priorities are and integrate it. And she, like David, has the patience of a saint and with her knowledge she can integrate it so she's not a they're not bossy if you know what I mean they're mm. just lovely <clears throat> lovely people who really love what they're doing and yeah if only the world were ruled by people more and more people like them it would be delicious eh? <laughs> I think that's the thing isn't it it's about um balancing that sort of humble edge of of their personality isn't it of not yeah. saying that I've got all the answers <clears throat> But um, being prepared to listen, because I think that's a skill we've lost as well, isn't it? Is um, oh. yeah, is um, actually you know this this idea of superiority that we have both over the natural world and the animal kingdom, we have that over yeah. it. It bleeds through over our ideas about different cultures, different people, and actually there is more and more like. A realization I think that the indigenous cultures have a huge amount to bring to the table and actually we need to start really listening to them and their wisdom of of how they've lived alongside the world as as opposed to our world view of you know, apart from it and using it and have you know it's and I suppose it's in New Zealand you've you've still got quite a strong indigenous identity and and people there is that right or well the Maori yes um particularly with the um the medicines the teranga that they have but um they a bit like the modern day Maori aren't necessarily interested in it it's a bit like you know with our grandmothers or our great grandmothers had potions and things the modern world had got in the way of not needing that stuff. And I think back to your point about the wisdom of it, now the way we have been operating in the last one or 200 years is we're wanting proof. Whereas these indigenous cultures, it was an inner knowing, a wisdom, a trust in the magic of the world and did not have to have scientific proof to embrace the idea to experiment with it and see where it went whereas we like evidence for everything and if it doesn't fit with what we did then we dismiss it and move it to something move on to something else and so we're just going in there destroying everything and then it's um pointing the finger at everybody else but ourselves why it's gone tits up basically yeah <laughs> yeah and I think um again it, it comes back to the idea of disconnect doesn't it and and this sort of and also our, our habit of um, like siloing things as well, separating, you know, you, we talked a little bit about borders in terms of a geographical sense, but we also put a lot of borders around, well, you know, your job is to look at this little element of it and your job is to look at this little element of it. I mean, even in, in human modern medicine, you know, we have people who specialize in you know this you've got to go to this specialist oh no you you've fallen out of that section you've got to go to this this specialist yeah. over here and it's it's this um sort of we we need this bigger picture looking and thinking don't we I mean I, I suppose holistic is is the the buzzword of the time but um 
Well, it's whole because everything is whole. It is, um, it is, it works in union. And if something's out of sync, then it's going to be out of whack. So it's the same with the human body. It's um, just because you happen to have something happening, you know, on the side of your face, it could have ha started somewhere else. And so, again, it's also about the environment. You might go to the doctor and say X, Y, Z has happened. But what about your home environment and your work environment and and everything else how has that impacted where you are at the moment and how is it going to help improve your health or help you sustain it and get well again in the future so there's no point in putting because that's what happens as you say even with governments and things we we just go round and round in circles calling it different names doing the same old bloody thing and wondering why it doesn't work um and that's the reason why, because we're not looking at the whole picture. And, you know, us adults think that we're superior to children. We need to keep them safe. But by goodness, children have the wisdom because they're not full up of all the shit that we've been told we ought to be doing. And when they've got these lovely, fresh, naive, innovative minds that we've lost connection to, you know? Yeah, that's it. We've, yeah. we've put all these rules in, in place, haven't we, of what can and can't yeah. happen and how <laughs> things can and can't happen. And yeah, whereas um, children have this this sort of this beautiful energy of, well, why not? Why not do it that way? Exactly. <laughs> and then, yep. Yeah. And I think it's it's that's that's the thing, isn't it? It's realizing that um, everyone has has something to bring to the table don't they everyone has yep. I guess a unique world view really and an understanding of of things in a way that perhaps someone else doesn't have and that may be one of the most powerful things that we've just touched on is is the idea of listening and and going in with more yep. of an open heart and an open mind and and seeing what you can learn and and yeah and how that because ultimately our reality is only based on perspective which is to do with the way that we understand the world and our own experiences and so to be humble enough to listen to someone's and be compassionate you know you come across people who have done uh, things that you would never cross your mind or something but when you take a step back and you think you know if I was in those shoes you know if I'd stolen you know, a can of soup or or a something rather and my children were hungry I would not have thought twice about doing it but um, I've never been in that situation and so people do extraordinary things to survive and we need to be more compassionate about each of our perspectives where we've come from and be humble enough to recognize there is a learning in it um i remember some big experiment with some prisoners um where they asked them to step forward if they'd had violence and drinking and all the rest of it and it was it really highlighted the environment in which they found themselves which for them created a perpetual need to survive and that's why they did the things they do and it helped them understand why they are where they are and what needs to change and so you know I've worked with horses and I work with a gang leader and for him to see things in a different light you can talk to the cows come home but unless you experience something for yourself you cannot see it in a different light and it was quite eye-opening he saw a horse with its head down and he thought the horse was going to attack him and it was a reflection oh, okay. of dog fighting yeah and so it was this horse relaxing in the sunshine you know and it's and unless he'd explained that to me I could not understand I was getting a yeah. different message from this because your, per your and, perception of the horse was it's relaxed it's content exactly. it's just having a snooze exactly. yeah yeah and he also went in the field with 20 horses and as a gang leader, he's used to watching his back and he thought he'd be attacked. Every single horse, they circled him on the outside of the field Then every single horse turned their back on him and one of them walked up behind him and put, rested his nuzzle on his shoulder and he didn't even hear it. And that just blew his mind. Mm. 
Yeah, yeah. I, um, cause you, are you, are you been involved in equine facilitated, uh, therapy? Have you? Yeah. 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 I, yeah. That's, a. I remember reading, um, Linda Kahanov, I think her, her name was, her book, Riding Between the Worlds. And, um, right. Yeah. And it's, it's, it's fascinating. The ho- horse is an amazing animal. I and mean, you obviously know I've, I've two of my own, but, um, I think their use in in therapy has come to the fore in the last sort of few decades, hasn't it? And it they are just it's incredible the the changes that people experience in those sessions because they don't have an agenda, and that's the thing. You can set up something and ask somebody to do something. So I mean, I can remember a horse coming by and pooping by the side. And I had a mother and daughter, and the mother said, that's what she does. She just leaves all her shit in front of me. And you cannot contrive a situation like that. And I had an ADH boy who would play up, and he knew he'd play up with the Ritalin, and I asked him to go and get this horse, and we don't give names. This one was called, oh, oh no, it wasn't Thunder. It was something that was quite... um uh, with a lot of energy I can't remember the exact horse's name now but the point was we don't give names because people have associations and cyclone that was it and um so I asked him to go and get this horse and um it wasn't a problem and he anticipated that it would be because of its name and I said so how does that reflect with your own life and he just laughed because then this other horse came by and bit this horse's bum and he said, now that's more like me. So he knew he'd play up to situation Mm. and you cannot, for the love of anything, contrive something like that. Um, They're just amazing reflective mentors and they pick up the energy. They're very gentle where people are scared or if someone's a bit full on they'll they'll you know they'll face up to them sort of thing yeah they're beautiful beautiful my name means lover of horses as well oh, so. huh. <laughs> yeah it was, it was written in your destiny then <laughs> something like that yeah something like that yeah <laughs> yeah I I am um, I I love I mean my I it's a privilege to have my own horses um it was something mm. I mean I've always been attracted to them from I, I don't even remember not being attracted to them. It is it's sort right. of something like that in my life. But um they are just amazing. They're, they're such sentient beings and um just they have like you said, it's just such a it's a, a calming, gentle energy. And um I know that one of the things I cherish the most about them is the fact that I I spend time with them at bookends every single day of my life. So um, you know, I kind of I find that grounding as well is to be in their presence. And you know, when when things have been challenging or difficult, it's you know, it's a place to go and take a breath and and sort mm. of reconnect. Um, to... because again particularly in England I know it's the snobbery around horses and the right and the wrong way to be riding them and actually when you've done the equine assisted learning facilitating it's about the connection and it's actually all groundwork you could I have a friend who goes to Germany every six months um working with horsemen and women um and helping them create that connection so that they are riding in rhythm with one another. But it is not the carrot and stick approach, which is atypical of my own experiences learning to ride in England, that um, one did it right. You know, it's a bit like the horse and hand, you know, whip the (laughs) shit out of them sort of thing until you get what you want, you know. And it's actually the realisation the horse is trying to tell you something. (laughs) Yeah, Yeah, no, I am... I also uh, have very much embraced um, that sort of, well, it's it's called horsemanship, but actually I think there's a strong element of humanship in it in terms of it's about... Well, that's what my friend calls his business, yeah. humanship. Yeah, okay. Yeah, no, it is, but it is. It's, it's um, I think I've, I've always very much found that it's about me, the more I learn about myself and the more I work mm-hmm. on myself, um, the deeper the connection has become 
with my horses. Um, yeah, and and that goes back to what we were saying earlier, doesn't it, about our connection to the natural world as well, and the fact that something everyone can do is they can just slow down and connect to themselves yep. a little bit more, get out of their head mm. and into their heart space, um, and just that that even though that might feel like you're not doing anything actually the the ripple effect from that can can be huge but that's where this world is it's the in order to be someone or be useful you have to be doing and that sitting and relaxing and being and connecting with ourselves is not something that we're taught and so it's uncomfortable to be in your own space and uh, have nothing to do yeah it's that's that's it isn't it it's the dis the discomfort you you have to yeah move through that that initial discomfort um and that's that takes takes time and patience but I think yes, I think that's um yes. I think that's a powerful place for us to sort of perhaps look at wrapping up Philippa but before we go yeah. is there is there anything else that you would like to share that to sort of impart a bit of your your family motto the hope hope in the through difficult times well it's the just that the nature of your your podcast the nature versus nurture um conundrum really you know bringing up children is it one or the other that influences it and um, recognizing that everything is a reflection of ourselves and to focus take the time out in your in but create the environment that actually makes you feel good take time out with yourself alone out in nature wherever that happens to be Put on a thick coat and go um, kicking leaves in the woods or um, just sit by the river or a stream or throw pebbles in or something. But just take five, ten minutes out each day and actually use your five senses as well when you're out in the world. But you can create a haven in your head and use that in meditation. And when you're feeling stressed or whatever, you can recall that and the brain doesn't really doesn't know that you're not really there so that is really helpful yeah I love yeah. that that's really lovely and um and I also find for myself some of my best sort of meditation is actually in movement in walking in nature I know the sort of a preconception that meditation is you know forcing yourself to sit in cross-legged position and and things but actually a great yeah. meditation is is what you said being in nature closing your eyes breathing in you know smelling touching feeling the world around yep. you in in mm. ways perhaps you haven't experienced before yep yep great Fantastic. perfect well thank you so much Philip, for for sharing your wisdom with us it's been an amazing journey across oceans and and exploring all sorts of ideas i've really enjoyed it so thank you so much for for coming for sharing that with us thank you for inviting me it's been an absolute pleasure to be with you Lovely. take care thank you so much for listening to the nurtured by nature podcast i truly hope this conversation has brought some hope and inspiration into your life i would love to have these messages ripple out across the world so if you can please share this episode with your friends leave a review on your favourite podcast player and make sure you subscribe so you don't miss the next episode. I would love to hear from you, so please feel free to connect with me on the links provided in the podcast description. But most importantly, thank you so much for being a part of this journey with me. But don't forget to simply get out there and enjoy the natural world. <laughs>